Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Christ Presbyterian Church in Hampton Cove, Alabama, where we proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Join us as we worship together and listen with your heart as teaching elder Mike Calvert brings us today's message from God's Holy Word. Good morning, everyone. If you could please begin making your way to your seats, we'll begin our service momentarily. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Christ Presbyterian Church. We're very glad you're here to worship with us today. My name is Norman Dean. I'm one of the deacons here at Christ Pres. And would like to take this time to remind you that if you have any spiritual or physical needs, please see me or one of the other church officers. And we'll be happy to help you however we can. If you're a first time visitor, we're especially glad that you're here. And we'd ask that you take one of the visitor's information cards. Uh, you can find those in the back of your pew, fill that out drop into one of the two offering boxes here at the, uh, into the center aisle uh, so we'll have a record of your visit. You can find a list of announcements uh, on the back of your church bulletin and there are two uh, that I want to draw your attention to. First is our spring picnic is this afternoon at four o'clock over here at the church house. That's gonna be a wonderful time. Uh, I know Bud and the team have uh, made plenty of meat so we're gonna have lots of food, uh, lots of fun. Come out with the kids, bring a lawn chair, should be a good time. Um, if you're a deacon or on the setup crew, if you could be out there by 3 o'clock to help with setup, that would be appreciated. Uh, the other announcement is uh, Adam Turnbull is organizing a men's morning devotional and prayer time. This is geared toward working age men. It's going to be early in the mornings, probably around 6 o'clock, uh, uh, location to be determined, maybe downtown, but we'll, we'll figure all that out, and also the days to be determined. But if that's something you'd be interested in, uh, please sign up out here in the narthex. Again, that's working age men, just a time of prayer, encouragement. Sign up out here in the narthex. Questions, ask Adam Turnbull. And um, that does it for the announcements. Please prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Thank you.
God's word from the prophet Jeremiah, the great new covenant prophet, calls us to worship this morning. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Praise his name. Will you join me as we offer our prayers to the Lord? Father, we thank you for your Son, who is the Lord, our righteousness. And we come before you as we wear his cloak of perfection, that in mercy you have clothed us with his righteousness, and we worship today in his name. And we thank you, Father, that you are are with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you inhabit the praises of your people, that you will speak through your word, And you will take delight in our words to you as we pray and as we sing, as we confess, and as we proclaim your word. And we pray that our meeting together today with you and with one another would change us and turn us into the people we should be for your glory. And we ask now that you would fill our hearts with strength and encouragement and let your word sound within us with great power, we pray. And we thank you for the day we have to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Turn to hymn number 115, all creatures of our God and King. Let's lift up our voices to the Lord.
Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Exodus in chapter 14. And this passage is, interestingly enough, about baptism. And a lot of times when we come to thinking about baptism, we don't, we don't think about the Old Testament. But the New Testament authors, particularly Paul, had this in mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll briefly read this just right before this. It says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and they were baptized into Moses. They were baptized into Moses. And so as we read this passage about the Exodus and the people going through the water, two things that we keep in mind is that baptism is about, not simply about salvation and wiping away sins, but it's also about judgment. Salve, uh, baptism is about judgment. And the other thing is that we are baptized into a mediator. We are baptized into a covenant mediator. As the Israelites were baptized into Moses, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. And so chapter 14, starting verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud look down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And of course, bapt baptized into Moses, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. And who is that and what has he done? We look to this creed, the Athanasian Creed this morning, and we see the not just simply the person of Christ, but the work of Christ on our behalf. And this is who we are baptized into. Is This is the one who has worked for you, and he's worked a great salvation. He has done much for you, believer. So let's um, look at this and confess this together. Um, we'll say this together um, from the Athanasian Creed this morning. We believe that Jesus, our Lord, suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, and rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. This is the Catholic faith, which except one believe faithfully, one cannot be saved. Please find him in the 
Please turn with me to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 this morning, we have seen previously in verses 1 through 11 what has already happened in us. By faith, the Spirit has set us free in Christ in order that we would now submit to God's law by obedience. But Paul now in verses 12 to 17 will present us with our current reality as Christians, that we are redeemed saints who presently wrestle with sin in our lives. But have this hope, we have been assured of our victory. Christ has conquered and we will conquer in him. But what of the sin that is still presently in our life? Well, of this sin, the spirit will lead us out of it and will lead us towards our heavenly reward in Christ. And in our fight, he will show us that by the things that we suffer, we will learn how to cry out to the Father, as he says here in Romans, and we will call him our Father. So read with me in Romans chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. May the Lord bless the reading and the believing of his holy word. We come now to our time of praying for the church. And let me again call your attention to the prayer list on the back of your bulletin. Uh, names of people who are ill uh, and have various uh, afflictions. And then names and places where our missionaries serve that we lift them up uh, together. We rejoice that we've had, in addition to our church family, Salem uh, Beam was born this week, the daughter of Jacob and Shay, and we've been praying for them, and the Lord has blessed them with a baby daughter, and we give him praise this morning. Our prayer today will be based on uh, the book of Colossians, where we find uh, some things to pray for. We're going to use the language of God's word to frame our prayer this morning. So will you pray uh, silently as I lead us together as we come as a church to the throne of grace? Our Father, we praise you that your beloved Son has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into his eternal kingdom. And we praise you that in your beloved Son, we have redemption and we have the forgiveness of our sins. And we praise you that once we were alienated and hostile in mind, we now belong to you. And we've been reconciled to you by the body of Christ, by his death and his burial and resurrection. And we are free now to present our bodies to you, holy and blameless. And one day you will present us to the Father. O oh, Son, you will present us to your Father, holy and blameless in your righteousness. Father, we pray that our hearts today as we gather together will be knit together in love and that will reach all the full assurance that you have for us through your word that will understand more and more of God's mystery which is Jesus himself and that will find in Christ all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge father we pray that by your spirit that as we've received your son our Lord that we would walk in him and that we'd be rooted in him and built up in him and established in the faith as your word teaches. And that we will always be abounding in thanksgiving. Father, we would pray that by your Holy Spirit you will enable us to seek the things that are above where our Lord sits. Where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And that we would set our minds not only this hour but every hour upon things that are above and not on things below on earth. We pray that as we've been chosen and made more than conquerors through your Son, that we would put on compassionate hearts for one another, and that we'd be known as a kind people, a, a humble people, a meek people, and 
patient with one another, bearing each other's burdens. And when there is a complaint with one another, that we would forgive each other as our Lord has forgiven us. And Father, we pray that above all the virtues, all the glorious fruit of the gospel, that we would put on love. For love binds everything together in perfect harmony. And we pray for that harmony among our members today, that you would protect us from any danger to that harmony so that the name of Christ will never ever be thought of with disrepute. And Father, we pray that the peace you give, the, the peace of Christ would rule our hearts. We, we bring our troubles to you today. And our anxieties, we bring our fears to you today. And they often accompany our prayers. And yet, we ask for that peace of Christ to guard our hearts. That your word would soothe our souls. And we pray, Father, that we would, even in the midst of difficult times, be thankful. And we would recognize that you were with us on the mountain and also in the valley. And we pray, Father, as we hear your word, that your word would dwell richly within us. And that you would teach us your word, that we might share with others, that we might teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and even singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and with great thankfulness in our hearts making melody to you and whatever we do father as your word commands whether it's in word or deed we pray that we would do everything in the name of the lord jesus and we would always give thanks to you through him and father we do lift up the needy in this congregation who are ill we lift up those expecting children and those who want children and Father, we lift up missionaries to you that we support. That all of these names and places and faces would experience your blessing and your power wherever they are. And Father, we pray for those spiritually troubled, even in this room today, that your word will feed and heal and deliver. We pray your word will convict us and make us strong. And that by the truth of your word, we would be more sanctified going out than we were coming in. And we thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you give us in life, the blessings that we do not have time, even in this life, to name, that you are showering us with blessings continuously, and we don't take them for granted. But we thank you most of all for Jesus and for the hope we have in him, and for the word he has for us now, that our Lord who lived and died and rose and ascended will now speak to his bride. And we pray we will listen and be blessed by that word. And now we ask that you would send your spirit to be the teacher of the word. And that our ears would hear what we need to hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's open God's Word together to the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter number 2. And this morning, I really want to read verses 3 through 5. If you're visiting with us, we've been traveling through this book rather slowly. And our aim is to look at the first four chapters uh, pretty, uh, um, uh, I guess, maybe uh, in detailed fashion. And then move a little quicker through the rest of the book. But we're, we're learning about the captive people of Israel. Why they went into captivity in Babylon. And why the Lord raised up this man named Ezekiel to minister to them as one of the captives. And we've looked last Lord's Day at the call and commission experience of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, who was training to be a priest, is now a prophet, and he is to bring the word of the Lord to the captive people there in Babylon. And he is to confront them with the word, confront them with a vision of God's glory. And he is also to name their sins. And we learned last Lord's Day that he's like a man with a, a jackhammer, a pounding rhythm and repetition is what we find as he enumerates the sins of God's people. They are a nation of rebels, he says. They are people who have rebelled. They have transgressed. They are impudent and stubborn. And through God's word and through an accurate picture of who they are, God 
will bring healing to them. Let's read now God's word, chapter number two, verses three through five. And he said to me, son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear you or refuse to hear you, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Last Lord's Day, we introduced this passage by by thinking of an x-ray or perhaps a CT scan. And God is doing that spiritually to his people. He's giving them an x-ray of who they really are and and why they are in captivity. They are getting deeper insight into the nature of their transgressions. They're getting the proper language of sin and they're seeing the justification for the consequences they have experienced. It's a painful thing to read. And again, the the painful experience is necessary if they're going to be healed and restored. Now, uh, where we left off last Lord's Day is I I gave you seven points of impact or application to us today from these introductory words of chapter 2. Because the question is, how does a book written 2,600 years ago to a people long dead by a man long dead, how does that even apply to people who live in the year 2024? How does it apply to Christians? And it does apply to Christians. It does apply uh, to the church. And so what we want to do is, is make seven points of connection to you and me. And so keep your Bible open there. And let's reflect on these points of impact where Ezekiel's message lands right in our laps today where we sit. Well, The first thing we learn, the first point of impact is we must be relentlessly suspicious of our own hearts, even as believers. Now, that's what Israel of old was learning. Israel of old had a distorted view of themselves spiritually. They were wondering, why are we in captivity? I mean, we're the chosen people. We're the good guys. Why are we in captivity? And that's often how we think. Our sin, like their sin, reaches down further than we can imagine. And we cannot know or process the depths of our sin or the persistent deceitfulness of our own hearts. I heard it again this week, and and I know you hear it perhaps monthly, if not weekly. You've got to trust your heart. I heard someone say, when all else fails, trust your heart. Trust your heart. And that's what Israel was doing, and that's why they were in captivity. They trusted their hearts to determine the truth. And their hearts lied to them. Uh, The prophets tell us that the heart of man is way above our understanding in terms of its deceptive nature. It, It fools us all the time. Our emotions fool us all the time. I think of God's word through the author of the Hebrew letter who says, It is the word of the Lord which is living and active. It's sharper than any two edged sword, and it pierces to the division between soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, your your heart has to be judged by the Word of God because your heart, the heart of a Christian even, will often lie to you. And that's why I say that we must be suspicious of our hearts. We must be very quick to judge our thoughts and our intentions and and, and the meditations of our mind. We we must judge them to the Word of God. The Word of God adjudicates them. The Word of God tells us whether they're right or wrong. We can't depend upon how we feel in order to determine truth. And so we have to be suspicious 
of our own souls. We are in the process of being made like Christ, but we're not there yet. And until we are there in glory, we must be suspicious of our own motives and desires and inner impulses. They must all be judged by the word of the Lord. There's a second point of impact. All of these are related. Some will be faster uh, or will go through them faster than others. But the second one that, that runs up and meets us is this one. Even we who know the Lord have a tendency to trivialize our sins. And that, that's what Israel was doing again. They're asking, why did the Lord destroy us? Why is the Lord about to destroy Jerusalem? Why has the Lord brought us into captivity? What did we do? Uh, what could we have done to, to merit this? And they, they, like us, often trivialize their sins. You see, uh, there, there's just something within the heart of every one of us that seeks self-justification. It just happens naturally. The spirit of the Pharisees is at home in our hearts. And, and like you, I, and I think everyone else, we will zealously resist the thought that our sins are worse than the other guy's sins. In fact, we, we would resist, and, and I would resist, applying Ezekiel's language to my own sins. Right? But, but listen to the language that Ezekiel is applying to the sins of the covenant people. And make a note of that. He is not describing the sins of the pagans. These words that I'm about to give you are descriptions of the covenant members. It, it's the redeemed. It's the ones Jesus loves, we might say. And uh, Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, you know, Lord, I'm a rebel? Have you done that? That's what Ezekiel's asking them to do. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, Lord, I am a transgressor. That is, I am a criminal. That's what the word means. I'm a criminal, even as a believer. Or, I am impudent. I am stubborn. I am brazen of face or hard of heart. I am persistently pushing back on you. And in verse 4, I refuse to hear. And I know that sounds strange, but that, that, that's exactly what the covenant people were doing so long ago, and it's what we do. We don't want to make a big deal of our sins. And here God is making a very big deal of the sins of his own people, and he's doing it to heal them, to heal them, not hurt them. And so we have to look in the mirror and say, my sins are what God says they are, not what I say they are. They're as big as God says they are, not as big as I want them to be. And so we can't trivialize our sins. It's a third point of impact. And that is that the Lord is never amused by the sins of his people, no matter their apparent size. Now, we'll spend a little more time on this one. The Lord is not amused by our sins. Uh, you, you hear things like this where you go, I hear it, uh, and, and I would imagine if we were honest, we'd say we, we say these things, you know, even as Christians, that there's one maxim out there in the church, no blood, no foul, you know, no blood, no foul. It's a small thing. Nobody really got hurt. I meant well, I meant well. Oh, the Lord will forgive me. You know, oh, he'll forgive me for that. Or, well... All I need to do is repent. I, I know I did something bad, and all I need to do is repent. I'm forgiven. No big deal. I'm washed in the blood. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. All is good with me. And so we blow them off that way. But when we think of our sins that way, when we speak of our sins that way, we are speaking in a language that is foreign to the Bible. In other words, when you read the Bible, you will not find our sins categorized into little ones and big ones, or consequential and inconsequential, or venial and mortal. They are just sins. I, I remind you of, of what Ezekiel sees in chapter 1, verse 28, the last verse in chapter 1. He, he says all of this, you know, the hurricane and the four living creatures, 
and the wheels and the chariot throne and the man on the throne. He says, this is a vision. And you can see it in verse 28. It is a vision of the glory of the Lord. And then we remember the Apostle Paul saying, our sins are those actions or inactions that fall short of the glory of God. Every sin, every little sin, is an offense to the glory of God. Our, our sins cannot be measured by the sins of others. Our sins have to be measured by the glory of our King. Our sins cannot be measured by their consequences on earth. And indeed, some sins have bigger consequences on earth. Some sins hurt more people than others. I, I understand that, but every sin, despite what consequences may play out on this earth, is an affront to the glory of God. Later in chapter 5, Ezekiel will enumerate this a bit further. He will say something that's pretty, pretty alarming, but relevant. In Ezekiel 5, verses 5 and 6, Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of this nation with countries all around her, and she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations, that is, more than the Gentiles, and against my statutes more than the other countries. They've rejected my rules, have not walked in my statutes. If, if the Lord is saying that the sins of Christians are worse than the sins of non-Christians, have you ever considered that possibility? That the sins we commit are bigger than the sins even of lost people? Well... They certainly get the divine attention quicker, don't they? Now, why is that? How could that be? Well, when we sin as Christians, we're sinning against the truth that we know. That's why Israel was in trouble. They had the law. They had the prophets. And yet they sinned with their eyes wide open. And that's, that's a problem. We, when we sin, we sin against the Spirit who dwells in us. You know, post-Pentecost, we are filled with the Spirit. You came to Christ, and the, and the Spirit of God made you a temple. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And together we are a kingdom of priests together. We are a holy tabernacle before the Lord, and the Spirit dwells here. But it just means that when we sin, well, we're sinning against the Spirit who indwells us. And when we sin, we sin against the body of Christ of which we are a part. And we sin against the holy name into which we've been baptized. And it just seems to suggest that, wow, our sins are pretty big. Even the smallest one, when committed by a believer, is a big one. And so the people of Israel in the year 593 B.C. needed to recognize the weight of their own sins. A fourth point of connection that's very important is that Israel is learning that before they call out the sins of the world, that is, before they call the world out for its sins, they have to deal with their own sins. Yeah. Uh, many of you will remember something Peter said. This is 1 Peter 4. And if I say it now, if I read it to you, you're going to go, oh yeah, I know that verse. Peter just makes this comment in his first epistle. He says, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I'm going to show my uh, age here and, and, and maybe reveal your age, but uh, the music of the early 70s was pretty, pretty big in my life. And some of you who are perhaps older will remember the name Carly Simon. Remember that name? Now, I'm about, to, I'm about to mess you up because I'm going to refer to a song, and at this point, that song is going to be stuck in your head all day. I know that's going to happen. Please forgive me for that. 
It's going to be a major distraction. Please forgive me, but it, it works as a good illustration. Okay. Carly Simon had a hit song. She wrote it in 72, and in 1973, it became the number one hit in several countries. You're so vain. Remember that song? Forgive me. Now you play it. Right? The record player's going, right? And you know the, the, the ironic line. So clever. You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. What a clever line. I was thinking about that this week. That song has just been, you know, on, you know, a loop, constant loop in my, in my head. And I was thinking, you know, here's Ezekiel's version of that song. Here's what Ezekiel says to Israel in captivity. You're so self-righteous and vain, you probably think this sermon is for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and we do that. You know, we, we, we hear, uh, you know, a prophet just having a fit. You know, when I was uh, coming up and learning uh, uh, homiletics, how to, how to preach and all that, my professor would say, you know, sometimes you just got to get up there and clear off a spot and have a fit, you know. And uh, Presbyterians are not allowed to do that. Uh, well, you can do that as a Baptist, and I did that for a while. But the prophet, the prophet, is just, he's just clearing off a spot and having a fit. He's just taking no captives. He's just letting it rip. And, and the people are saying, oh, man, you are telling them off. You know, those Babylonians, those Egyptians, you know, and just naming the, the countries and those, those slimy people there and those awful people. Boy, you are telling them off. And then Ezekiel says, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm talking about you. You know, th this sermon is about you, not them. And that's why in chapter 9, and I go back to Peter's word, in chapter 9 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel will hear God initiating a judgment upon the world. And he will say to Ezekiel in chapter 9, verse 6, Begin at my sanctuary. Now that's where Peter got his verse. He was thinking about Ezekiel. That judgment begins with God's people. So here's the problem I have. And I suspect that you have. I have 2020 vision when it comes to everybody else's sins. But sometimes I'm as blind as a bat when it comes to my own. And the Lord says that needs to change. That spirit that sees the sins of others first, long before it recognizes its own transgressions, needs to be obliterated. It needs to go. That's what got Israel into trouble. Again, that's the spirit that judges others before turning the guns on itself. And God's people have to say it begins with me. And before I am calling out the world, before I'm calling out my brother, before I'm angry at what's going on around me in the culture, I need to be angry at my own sins. I, I need to let the judgment of God's Word fall upon my sins. Right. I, I need to confess my sins. And the spirit of the Pharisee needs to die. And that's why they're in captivity, to learn that. That's part of their healing, you see. They can't be healed until they judge themselves. A the fifth point of connection. In this life, as Christians, we will never grow past the need for diligent and persistent repentance. Yeah. You know, if we think of Old Testament Israel in captivity as Israel saved, I mean, it, it, they're, they're saved people. They're going to be the remnant, right? They're going to be redeemed. And yet, even though re redeemed they are, they, they need to repent. Now, now that brings up a question, uh, and, and it's a good question. And if you're thinking it, I, I commend you. you. You should be asking, wait a minute now. I repented when I came to Jesus. Well, you did. And so there are two kinds of repentance. When we, we read the Word, we can, we can establish the fact that there are two kinds of repentance. 
And, and for lack of a, a better way of describing them, we might say there's the repentance of regeneration and the repentance of sanctification. Now, the people of Israel allegedly had repented and, and, and been born again, we would say, using the New Covenant terminology. They were saved. There was a time when they recognized they were sinners, they needed the mercy of Yahweh, and they, they just threw themselves on His mercy, and He redeemed them. And so that, that, that came about through repentance, that one-time turning from sin to Christ. You see, that? That, that's what happened to you. It happened to me. That, that, that happened one time. You can only be born again once. You can only be regenerated once. You can only be saved one time. And that's the repentance of regeneration. But when, when we do that, we're not through repenting yet. Because there's a repentance that's very appropriate to the life we live right now as Christians. That's the lesson Ezekiel's generation needed to learn. They needed to live in the spirit of repentance. You see, when you, you live in the spirit of repentance, you're always turning from that which displeases the Lord to that which brings Him glory. You're always turning away from your sins and turning to Christ in obedience and love. That just characterizes who we are. We are a repentant people. Jesus put it this way, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's what He's talking about who have no confidence in their flesh, who recognize they are sinners, who know even as redeemed they are simultaneously justified, yet still sinful. And when the Spirit of God brings conviction, they, they turn and they cling to the cross. And that's how we're to live. Israel in captivity needed to learn that. And, and we need to learn. We, we never grow past the need to repent. And I, I, again, I, I've given you this quote uh, uh, probably in 20 years, probably 30 times at least. One of the great Puritan prayers. Lord, even my prayers of repentance need to be repented of because they are staying with sin. And that's not morbid introspection. It's not a gloomy view of life or salvation. It's the reality that even as Christians, in this life, we still fall short of the glory of God, though we are redeemed. And the acknowledgement of that puts us in touch with amazing grace. And there can be no experience of amazing grace on a daily basis without the discipline of repentance. And that's another point of connection, repentance. There's a sixth point of connection, and this one's going to sting a little bit, as I'm sure it did for Ezekiel's generation. When we repent, we must use the biblical language of sin. The biblical language. Now, obviously, I'm contrasting the biblical language with some other kind of language. And, and you could call this other kind of language many things. The language of the world, the language of the self, whatever you want to call it. Uh, God's language and man's language. And if I'm going to repent, I have to use God's language when I'm describing sin. Over here, you hear this language when it comes to sin. A mistake. A lapse in judgment. A victim of someone else's actions. You might hear someone say, it's just my personality. You know, I took a temperament test, and I'm a jerk. <laughs> and so I get, I get a pass because it's who I, I'm just a jerk, you know. Or I have a disorder. I looked it up this morning. I wanted the, the, most, the most relevant and freshest data in some medical textbook out there, some database out there of, 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 of disorders. There are, there are 200 disorders of the mind that have been identified. And many of those used to be called sin. It's now a disorder. You know, I got this disorder. It just makes me want to kill everybody. 
you know. I have a disorder. It makes me cuss all the time, you know. I've got this disorder, you know, and it, it makes me cheat on my income taxes. I mean, everything's a disorder, right? Except for God. And so the Israelites are learning to use God's dictionary, not their own. Now, I want you to think about some of the language that we're going to run into. We, we're, we've run into some of it already, but we're going to get a lot more of this. And I want to show you, I want to show you three words that Ezekiel uses. And I'm going to tell you how often he uses them when he describes the sin of God's own people. Now, this is going to make you sweat a little bit, but you just buckle your pew belt and hang on. He uses the word iniquity 20 times. Iniquity. That is what characterizes God's own people. Iniquity. Iniquity is the act of offending God's law and holiness. Iniquity. That's a big word. 37 times he uses the word wicked or wickedness. If iniquity is offending God's law and offending his holiness, then wickedness, or to be wicked, is, it is ungodliness. It is wrongdoing. It denotes, quote, a people who have done wrong and are still living in sin and are intent on continuing that sin. That's what wickedness is. You're doing it, you know you're doing it, and you're going to keep on doing it. That's wicked. And that's describing God's people. And then there's a big one we're going to run into a bit later, but he uses it 41 times. And you can quote me on that. This is the big one. The word abomination. Abomination. Now that, that word seems to fit the world. We see a lot of things out there that are abominable. That is detestable, loathsome, disgusting, contrary to God's nature, sinister, repulsive. All of those are synonyms, right? But Ezekiel is not speaking of the world when he says abomination. He is speaking of God's people. And if we really, really humble ourselves this morning, we will say, he is speaking of me. He is speaking of my sins, even as a Christian. An abomination. An abomination. I can't repent until I use the right words. And these words, these biblical words that are synonyms for the word sin, take me to the truth about what sin is. Because I will never, ever in this life or in any life understand the wonder and glory of God's grace if I don't understand the awfulness of my sins. And they are in captivity to learn what sin is. And it is to fall short of the holiness and the infinite majesty and glory of God. There are no Small sins. Now, having depressed you thoroughly, I'm sure, I want to lift you up. Because God's Word does that. There's a seventh point of connection. And this will bring us to the Lord's table in just a few minutes. When these previous six points of connection become ours... When we suspect our hearts and we don't trivialize our sins and we don't judge the world first and we use the biblical language and we repent and all of this, then and only then can we taste the sweetness of God's all-sufficient grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Then and only then. The Lord is not unloading on His people through the prophet just to smash them into the ground. He's not doing that. In fact... What's driving this sermon from Ezekiel is love, a strong love, love. The people are being disciplined by love. They are a captive audience, literally, and they have a preacher named Ezekiel, and he is going to preach a whopper of a sermon 
And that's motivated by love. The Lord is not trying to hurt His people. He's not trying to crush them. The bruised reed. The smoldering wick. He, he will be tender with. But, but he, has to, he has to be the great physician of the soul. He, he can't tell you you have a cold when what you have is leprosy. He has to tell you the truth. And so he put his people in a position where they had to listen to the prophet. And he begins to preach this expose of their souls so that they will understand and experience and be set free by the grace of God. Now let me, let me tell you something. This is exactly how you were saved in the first place. All right? Think back to when you became a Christian. Whatever time that was, however it happened. There will be many, many things that are unique about our experiences of coming to Christ. Uh, different times and circumstances and different ways and all of that. Praise His name for that. But we all have in common this. The Lord said to us what He said to Adam. Where are you? He came to us. He confronted us with His word. And my experience was really as, as a covenant child. I remember it well. Uh, just as, as, a, as a little boy, five or six, I, 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 I do remember this. The, the feeling that I am a sinner. And, and whatever degree, uh, to whatever degree a child can experience the crushing weight of that, I felt it. As if God were saying, Mike, where are you? What have you done? Now the Lord was not doing that to... To condemn me, he was doing that to save me. But he, but he had to stop me in my tracks, and I had to see myself a, a, as a sinner. And that's all I knew. I didn't know much more than the thief on the cross knew. I am a sinner. He is a Savior. I need Him. And that's all the Lord is doing to the people in exile. And that's what he's doing to us this morning. He's taking us back to how we became a Christian in the first place. It's, it's how he saves us, but it's also how he sanctifies us. So every now and then, the Lord sends a preacher who preaches on sin to God's own people so that they will humble themselves and find a fresh experience of his grace Awaiting. That's how the Lord leads us, leads us to live lives based on grace. You see, I am tempted to fall into the trap of believing I'm doing pretty good. And the Lord must be proud of me. He's ready to give me a promotion. I'm going to get a raise. I'm doing so well. And I find that spirit of the Pharisee swelling up within me. And then he shows me what I've been delivered from. He takes me to the graveyard. He takes me to the city dump. And I see there's the contents of my heart. That's, that's what was in there. And some of that's still in there. And that's what he saved me from. And it stinks. And that stench is still on me in some degree. And I need mercy. And when I turn to him, there is more mercy there than there was the day before. And that's how it works. It is not only how we are saved by being confronted with the truth. Of ourselves, but it's how we are continually sanctified. Now, that explains something, and there's a light bulb going on perhaps in your mind right now. That's why we think biblical worship should always be a rhythm of guilt, grace, and gratitude. Guilt. I. I I, I have to face that. I, ha I have to understand what I've been saved from, even as a Christian. And then I see God's grace. And then I'm moved by that grace to give more of myself to Him. And to do so motivated by love and gratitude. That's what the Lord is trying to do to Ezekiel's audience. And it's what he's doing to us this morning by taking us here. This is how Ezekiel's ancient message speaks to us. What has God done in your heart today through his word? Has he done a little surgery? Well, if he has, it's 
to bring healing. Has he crushed you? It's so that you might stand. Have you felt guilt? It's so that you might know his grace. There are no wasted sorrows for God's people. He is loving us and sanctifying us, even as his word tells us the truth about who we are. And may we run to Jesus and see his grace in a fresh light and give ourselves to him as living sacrifices. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. And now let's prepare our hearts to come to the table of the Lord. Will you pray with me as we come to our time of prayer and confession? And you can frame your own prayer of confession. And I'm going to lead us aloud. But you, you do business with the Lord and confess your sins to Him, even as a Christian. And then we're going to hear His word of deliverance. And then see this deliverance in symbolic form in just a moment. Father, we are, thank, we are thankful for the hard passages. Uh, we, we love the ones that speak of the blessings we have and the riches we have in Christ. We thank you for those. But the ones that really help us to see our sins are the ones that are difficult. And yet we thank you for them. That in the pain we've felt this morning, there is the promise of healing. That as awful as our sins are, even as Christians, they have been paid for. The wrath that we deserve has fallen upon our Savior. There is no condemnation for any one of us in Christ Jesus. We've been set free. And we thank you, Father, that you're not through with us, that your Spirit is making us holy day by day, that we are being sanctified, that you're causing us to love righteousness and hate sin, to think your thoughts after you, to value what you value, to treasure the things you treasure, and to see the things as beautiful that you see, as beautiful. And Father, we thank you that even though we know we are sinners and we know tomorrow we'll sin, we know that until you come, we will be at war. We thank you that we have hope and victory even now. That no temptation has overtaken us, but such as is common to man. And that your spirit provides strength and the way of escape. That Jesus has defeated the devil for us. And that we belong to his kingdom. And we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. And so we pray you'll wash our sins away. And we turn from them. We, we pray you'll forgive us for the things we now recognize we've done. That we shouldn't have done. And the things we didn't do that you commanded us to do. And the thoughts and desires and words, actions that we know have fallen short of your glory. We thank you that even before the words leave our mouths, we are forgiven in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for your word of assurance that in your great mercy, you have given us new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and that his bodily resurrection is the proof that our sins have been dealt a death blow and we give you praise now meet us at the table with your strength and your encouragement and build us together into a great temple of the holy spirit we pray in jesus name amen amen well there's some some sweetness here at this table uh, sometimes the lord's word is is hard to swallow and then we always end with the sweetness of His mercy that speaks for us, that answers our guilt. And here it is in visible form, the bread that represents the broken body of Christ. Not, not broken bones, but His soul crushed under the weight of God's wrath. And so He was treated as one who was an abomination and one guilty of iniquity and wickedness. Can you imagine that the Son of God was, was given our sins and all of the wrath that such sins are due fell on Christ and not on us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And then we think of His blood 
that signals his death. Uh, he, he had to do more than just suffer and bear the weight and the gravity of our sins. He had to die as a condemned man, and he did. And his blood testified to his death. And then they took the body of Jesus, put it in the tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, and there he lay until Sunday morning, and God raised him from the dead. And that is what dispensed with your sins and guilt and mine. <laughs> you know, now that's worth coming to church to hear right there. Right there. Th there you go. That's all that matters, is that your sins and my sins, my abominations and yours and your iniquity and mine and my wickedness and yours and, and that which is to come has been dealt a death blow by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And this supper helps us to believe that. And so we'll hold the bread and hold the cup and as tangible and real as these things are, the lesson is God's grace is even more real than what we feel and what we taste. This helps us believe the promise. And so let the sacrament do its work in you and by faith will you trust that Christ has lived and died and been raised for you and then you now can walk in newness of life and you can be sanctified, you can live a life of repentance, a life of holiness, a life of obedience because your Savior has made you new. And so Father, we thank you for this bread and this cup, for what they signify, for what they mean, and for, for your power that uh, attends this sacrament, that there is the power of the Spirit at work, mysteriously, in us, through us. And Father, we pray that we might be nourished on Christ, the, the strength we need to be obedient, the strength we need to walk with you, what we don't have, and yet you give it. And would you give it now? And would you give us the consolation, the peace, the encouragement we need to, to fight a good fight of faith for the next seven days and to remain loyal to Jesus and full of hope. And would you bless us to be one, to be one glorious body of Christ in love with our Lord and in love with one another so that we might bring glory to you. All this we pray and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise his name. Hallelujah. What a great, great Savior we have. What hope we have. And we have a reason to sing. We're going to sing a testimony of our God's sovereignty. We serve a sovereign Lord. He's got this. He's got everything. He's got the whole world in his hand. The whole universe in his hands. And we're going to sing that as we go. And then we're going to come back at 4 o'clock and share fellowship together around the trees, and around some good Presbyterian food, all right? You come and be a part of that. If you're a guest, come and be a part of our fellowship as we carry on uh, the great tradition of the church to gather together in fellowship in the name of Christ. Let's stand together. The words are in your bulletin. Let's sing about our sovereign God. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Apostle Peter as you go. May you look forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And may you be found in Christ, spotless and blameless, and at peace with him when he comes. Amen. This online worship service is brought to you by Christ Presbyterian Church. Visit our sanctuary at 288 Old Highway 431 South in Hampton Cove, Alabama, each Sunday morning at 1030, and you can join us in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. To learn more about Christ Presbyterian Church, visit us online at ChristPresHamptonCove.org.